Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, I'm Marianne Dyson. I'm going to introduce uh, Jeff Lauer. He's the co-founder of Pioneer Rocket Plane and he's vice president of business development. Uh, Mr. Lauer is the president of Peregrine Properties in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and is responsible for arranging financing. He was an advisor to the NASA Aerospace Industry Commercial Space Transportation Study. And I had down that he was going to talk about space business parks, but he tells me it's Willie Sutton in space. And um, I told him I didn't know who Willie Sutton is, so I'm going to let him tell you. He told me to, and I think it's, it's fun. So I'll let him. Uh... Hey, thank you. Um, for those of you that uh, don't get the reference, um, this is uh, either a true story or urban, urban, urban legend, depending on who you ask. But uh, Willie Sutton was a bank robber in the 30s, and when he finally got caught, uh, one of the FBI guys asked him, why do you rob banks? And that was the answer. So the point of this talk is to talk about commercial space facilities, space business parks, uh, all sorts of private sector things that will be done in space, but the point here is private sector requires money to do it. It requires a return on that investment to make the deal work. Therefore, the big part of all things having to do with commercial space in the next couple of decades is how do you make each little deal pay for itself. So you're trying to find money. You start with the pie. Um, and uh, if you look on this little pie chart here, Uh, if you look on this little pie chart, uh, something comes out here. Two-thirds of the U.S. economy is consumption. And uh, you've got the government over here at 17%, and uh, uh, the traditional aerospace industry is one small segment of this slice here. And if you look uh, on this eye strain chart here, um, and you look at the Fortune 500, the, uh, the, the top companies are largely consumer companies. Uh, GM, this is a couple years old, but GM at $170 billion, and Ford right next to it at $130 billion, making all of those billions selling product at dollars to $30,000 per unit sale. Um, is, uh, somebody uh, take a guess, where would NASA fall if NASA were a company? Uh, where would they fall in the Fortune 500? Anybody know? 104. Pardon me? About 104, they fall right off the chart. Yeah, yeah, it's actually, this year it's 114. But uh, yeah, the, so, so NASA as a business is certainly not a player in terms of this sense of the word. If the Defense Department were a business, they would be bigger than GM. So uh, you know, take whatever moral you, uh, you will from that. But uh, uh, you know, space is not that big an industry compared to a lot of the other aspects of the economy. Overall, total industry, including military and civilian, is $130 billion a year, typically selling products that uh, retail out at uh, $1,000 to $2,000 a pound. If you, if you were going to price out an F-16 or a jet engine, um, they are uh, denominated typically in the thousands of dollars a pound. You talk about the space station, you can add a couple of zeros to that. and. Then if you factor in the cost of the shuttle missions to get them up there, and another couple of zeros. But uh, this is a very uh, high value industry in terms of the uh, poundage of product in relation to the total industry. And when you look at um, the launch segment of this, you're really talking about chunk change. The US launch industry is a few billion dollars. The segment of the launch industry that most of us in the ROV startup world are trying to go at is, is like a billion dollars. You know, Leo launches is not a big industry, and even with the um, you know the growth of the Leo constellations and all, it's going to be a niche market by any conventional standard. Uh, you compare compare that to uh, <coughs> to uh, the <laughs> the freight transportation industry. Here you've got an overall industry that's about 450 billion a year, four times as big as aerospace. Uh, does consume some elements of aerospace at the high value end of it for the fast passenger, and the price per unit tends to uh, uh, tends to get up there to the point where things like uh, hypersonic passenger or I'm sorry, hypersonic package delivery, you know, may start to make sense when you look at uh, price per units of a few hundred dollars a pound. Potentially, this element of the business could be bigger than even the optimistic 
launch projections of, uh, of the FAA. And so uh, what you want to do is look at where are the opportunities, where are the areas that you can bring money to the table to afford to pay for your investment. Um, when you look at the adventure travel industry, um, the adventure travel industry is five times as big as the launch industry. And this is a small segment of the overall travel industry, but you look at, uh, you know, what do people do? There's somebody earlier was saying they were on an Antarctic cruise. So there's one, one of the 10,000 people was, was in this room. And typically Antarctic cruises are tens of thousands of dollars. Um, a, a lot of things you can point to where you're looking at fairly high value. Um, you look at, a, at an Everest climb and you typically are looking at $100,000 per person for the expedition. And uh, this is a real interesting statistic. Out of all the people that have tried it, uh, 600 have made it to the top. This is one of them. This is actually Mike McDowell, uh, who is uh, an investor of ours and pioneer and uh, uh, co-founder of one of the space adventure travel companies, Space Adventures. Uh, and so you, uh, uh, you look at the uh, safety rates and you have, if you make it to the top, uh, you, uh, to, to get there, you have about a one in four chance of dying on the way up. So when you talk about reliabilities, or, or dying on the way down, I guess it doesn't really matter, you're still dead. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the levels of safety that would be required uh, do not necessarily have to be that uh, you know, Boeing standard four nines of reliability in order to develop a significant industry and make some money at it. And you look at uh, uh, you know, the overall view here, here this is the view at 30,000 feet that somebody paid um, 100 grand or so to do. This is the view at 80,000 feet in one of those uh, MiG-25 fighter rides at Space Adventure cells. And this view will cost you about $20,000. Uh, so what, uh, you know, what, what's the potential value of this view? Nobody knows yet. We're all, a lot of us are trying to find out. But there is, there is an interest. Uh, this uh, was a, uh, a popular science article when the station first came out. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of interesting things in here, but the real relevant point from this standpoint is uh, 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 question four. If you had the opportunity to go, um, would you be interested? And so you have 82% uh, of the people that were surveyed said that they would be interested in visiting the space station and 12% said they would pay whatever it takes. So you can start to draw out that there are people, so it, it, if you take the top 1% of income earners, which is people, people typically that make a million dollars a year in income, not a millionaire in net worth, but a millionaire in the sense that that's what their 1040 says every year, and that, there, there are hundreds of thousands of people with that kind of, of buying power and uh, whatever it takes response from 12% of them means that there are potentially tens of thousands of people willing to pay seven-figure amounts to be able to visit the space station. To me, that is a very encouraging statistic. You potentially can uh, tap into uh, a, broad, a broader base uh, a little further down the road if you do the things that Zegram and Space Adventures are doing right now where you take deposits, you put money into escrow account and let it uh, ride, uh, depending on what your uh, return on investments are, uh, potentially if you've got a good mutual fund manager, you by the time you actually confirm your ticket, you could get half of your money back in terms of the appreciated value of the portfolio. But if you have a, a ticket price in the range of a half a million bucks and you're marketing it now, uh, the, the current transaction would be uh, under $100,000. And there's a lot of things that you can point to in the domestic economy that are consumer discretionary expenditures in the $100,000 range. The travel and tourism industry as a whole uh, is one of the biggest industries in the country. $500 billion a year, 7% of GDP, with growth in excess of the growth in GDP. So this is a high growth market that is um, generating a lot of people's interest and a lot of experiences. And one of the fundamental premises of the whole talk about commercial space facilities, it really is brought home here. Business and recreational travelers share much common infrastructure. You don't build an industrial airport, a businessmen's airport, and a tourist airport in most markets. The ratio of business to uh, 
uh, pleasure travel may vary from one particular market to another, but an airplane doesn't care if it's uh, got a businessman in it or a tourist in it. And uh, even things on the, uh, the Panama Canal uh, passes both tourist ships and freight ships. So the, the premise of having dedicated facilities just to do tourism or just to do space manufacturing simply doesn't hold when you look at how the rest of the world economy works. And so anything that's built in space would have to be flexible enough to deal with both business travelers, recreational travelers, entertainment industries. The, the point is to broaden your base. And uh, you know, one of the areas to broaden your base in is to look at the, uh, at the gambling industry. Now, the way the gambling industry reports its statistics, uh, for legal gambling, you have $50 billion a year in annual revenue. That is the, uh, that's the big, that's what the house makes. But in order to generate that, there is $500 billion of betting activity going on. The guy that's putting that dollar in the slot or putting the chips down in the roulette table is making his own discretionary decision about what he's going to do, and that particular transaction is either a win or a loss. And so you look at the economy and you say, well, you know, there's a lot of money sitting on the table there. It's generating billions of dollars a year in new investment. Uh, this is the Bellagio. Uh, so you have things that are billion dollar class that are going up several times a year in Vegas and, and similar investment elsewhere in the country, uh, to say nothing of the rest of the world. Another big industry, bigger than aerospace uh, and uh, highly competitive, is advertising. $180 billion a year is spent on advertising. You look at the distribution of where that money goes, and um, uh, print media, television, these are largely the elements of what defines ourselves as a culture, what defines our economy, our sense of being Americans, comes from the media, from television, from movies. All of this stuff is fueled by the advertising industry. And advertising can take a lot of different forms that are directly related to space. Uh, you, you have uh, uh, the uh, brand loyalty showing up in, in the garb that you wear in a lot of cases. And that is an element of the uh, future commercial space economy that I think is largely overlooked. The toy industry is... Um, what, uh, uh, 10 times bigger than the launch industry. And uh, um, again, I think this is, this is an urban legend, but the, uh, uh, the licensing of the Sojourner uh, designs to Mattel uh, potentially generated as much money for Mattel as the whole mission cost NASA to do. Uh, and um, NASA gave that license away. In fact, they paid somebody to help them write the free license. So there's an awful lot of money left on the table there that uh, really could be plowed back into the, uh, the types of things that have to happen to build the, uh, um, the space infrastructure that we all would like to see at some point uh, in the near future. Sports and entertainment is another one that is presently unrepresented in the sector of the economy that we're trying to tap to do what we want to do here. But you have in direct expenditures, $40 billion of spent on that, $65 billion spent in other elements of entertainment besides sport. And when you factor in merchandising, sales, clothing, and all of that, you have $180 billion here in addition to the money that's spent in advertising. So you can start hypothesizing about things where um, a zero-G sports venue potentially could generate more money uh, for, in addition to generating passenger traffic for the people that are going up there for play and the spectators that are up there, the feeds of a professional zero-G sports league potentially could be worth a lot of money. And um, uh, there's no reason why it can't be an element of, uh, uh, of any, uh, uh, I'll skip that one, uh, of any other uh, uh, thing that's going to be coming up in, in space in the near future. So. The point here is that orbital infrastructure grows in response to market pressures exactly the same way it does on Earth. There is nothing new here. This is how the Western capitalist economy works. And over periods of decades, 
you can look at, uh, yeah, this is the infrastructure of the late 80s through the 90s, this is the available infrastructure for the next 10 years. Over the next 10 years after that, you can start to see larger scale, purely commercial um, uh, LEO uh, space assets being developed uh, as a heritage of the hardware that's been developed from space station and growing to uh, the, the sort of facilities that Greg was talking about. This is actually Pat Rawlings' design that was the cover of the New Space Industries workshop that uh, took place last year. Uh, this is a facility for a couple hundred people that has uh, some zero-g uh, staterooms, some uh, spin graph staterooms, and a couple of large uh, spherical arena play structures for things like the sports and entertainment, and then all your power and thermal and everything is in a massed uh, up the gravity gradient. So this facility as a whole could be a 50, 60 story uh, uh, skyscraper structure equivalent and cost some number of billions of dollars but support itself off of the, uh, the different industries that are working in here, both tourism and um, business type uses that would all share the same transportation infrastructure and the same uh, housing infrastructure. <coughs> So this is the real question. What is all this stuff worth? You've got companies spending billions of dollars a year on advertising and brand promotion. Uh, Michael Jordan made $47 million in product endorsements in addition to his salary. Tiger Woods makes $25 million a year uh, in endorsements and he wins a couple million dollars a year on the tour. Uh, there are a lot of things that could happen um, if you start tapping into this segment of the economy, you put the little Nike logo on the uh, spacesuit or the uh, Pepsi sphere uh, floating around the space station. These are big buck events. The amount of technology needed to do this is trivial. What really has to happen is a mindset and a break of the stranglehold of NASA over human activity in LEO. Uh, as soon as you can make that break, then things like this can start to happen. And what, uh, just a little, little sidebar here, what if you had a situation, there, uh, Greg was talking about lunar stuff, uh, um, if you had a uh, match play golf game of lunar golf, Michael Jordan versus Tiger Woods playing golf on the moon, my guess is that each of those guys would be willing to pay a significant amount of money of their own to do it if it were available, but there they happen to have the same sponsor, and if you had um, uh, those two guys playing, who are the other two guys that would want to round out the foursome and how much would they be willing to pay? And if you had a little robotic caddy that was being driven by somebody teleoperated from the earth, what would those guys driving the caddy cart be willing to pay for uh, caddying around on each hole? It is completely trivial in terms of being able to do all the high-minded things people talk about in space, curing cancer, curing AIDS, finding new wonder drugs, blah, 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 blah. And that is really uh, a noble purpose of space, but most of what makes up our economy is about the furthest thing from noble. And we've got to get over this high-minded, uh, too pure to be uh, uh, tarnished with this crass commercialization stuff. Crass commercialization is what will develop orbital infrastructure. And uh, some of it can be pretty crass. <laughs> so we have to, uh, we have to be thinking about um, broadening our minds and dealing with things that can, uh, that can make a lot of sense in terms of the overall private sector world. When you build a new hotel, uh, you uh, go before your planning commission and your township board to try and get permission to do it. And the things that are looked at when you're trying to do a deal typically don't involve uh, how you're going to better all mankind. What they involve is uh, how are you going to impact the neighbors and how much money are you going to make and how are you going to be able to satisfy the requirements of the local government. Um, the same sort of thing should apply to uh, orbital assets. When you look at a facility like this, uh, this design is intended to be the um, sort of the next thing. It's, it's a notional design, but it's the next thing after space station. It, uh, I think, by necessity, would be a fully privately owned and developed uh, facility because uh, the government well is pretty dry and will be for a long time. And so you look at things that are uh, sort of spin-off module based, thermal radiators, this happens to show a solar dynamic power system rather than PVs. 
and has a couple of uh, large volume structures up in here, which would be the, uh, um, the, the zero G soccer fields and the play spaces. Uh, but it would largely be traceable to the technology that's being developed and um, could go back into the, uh, uh, into the NASA world by effectively licensing the technology and buying the tooling to build modules and building additional modules using the same basic systems at a fraction of the cost of what has been uh, spent so far. A lot of what was uh, spent on space station uh, was not in the production value of the hardware. It was figuring out how to do it, building the tooling, doing all the testing and qualifying. The incremental cost of anything like this is, is a fraction of what the sunk cost is for the hardware that uh, is, in, is being installed right now and, and will continue to be built over the next five years. So we have to try and use what we, uh, what we have existing right now uh, avoid as much DDT and E as possible and build a business case for something that you know that you can do and then grow from there. Uh, the, originally this was intended to be a recycled external tank uh, chopped into the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen components up in here. The new technology with uh, inflatables and, and transhaf potentially could generate the same uh, you know, 30 by 100 foot type uh, structures uh, using deployable inflatables. I don't really care. I mean, there are people here that have religion uh, about uh, ETs or the solution to everything. I don't necessarily share that view. Uh, I have yet to see anybody really show me a compelling case that you could uh, do um, uh, any, with them anything other than reuse them for tanks. Now, in, uh, in certain business scenarios, you can see that uh, having large volume tanks up there could be a very handy thing to do, and I'd like to see somebody uh, try and recycle some of them. But uh, you know, the, I tend to, to back off of this because, for one thing, I don't have permission from these companies to use their logo, so uh, this is all just among friends here. But uh, I mean, reality is that uh, you're not going to have pristine white surfaces. You're going to be doing logos, you're going to be doing advertising, and uh, wh whether uh, you are as, uh, as packed full as a, as a hockey backboard or uh, a race car driver's uniform, who knows? It's all a matter of degree, but there is going to be this uh, going in here, and my guess is that you will be seeing some of this stuff even on the space station, uh, current policy notwithstanding. Um, so the the idea here, th this is a standard 14 and a half foot diameter module lengthened out by one cylindrical section. So this is 36 feet in diameter, carved up into uh, staterooms uh, that are uh, fairly small, but uh, um, uh, this would be the equivalent of the bed and breakfast hotel where the bathrooms are down the hall. Uh, I really think you will have some period of time, probably the better part of the decade, before you can get to the level of uh, accommodations that we have in this hotel. Individual <laughs> bathrooms, I think, uh, are a ways down the road, and potentially uh, spin gravity uh, facilities are, uh, are equally far away. The idea that people want to go to space and don't want to experience zero gravity, I, I think, is, uh, is questionable. I think in the early terms, part of what is attractive is the zero-G experience and that you don't need to go all the way to spin grab uh, to be able to make the case that you could have uh, a near-term uh, space hotel facility. This facility is, is more of a bed and breakfast class. You have a total of 36 people on board uh, this particular design of which uh, uh, we've assumed that 12 are long-stay people that are there either as uh, staff or doing uh, uh, company research and things like that, and that you have 24 people at a time that are going uh, in and up, uh, up and down on uh, roughly two week stays. Um, it really, the, probably the nearest terrestrial metaphor for this class of experience would be the whitewater rafting trip. You have a group of people, you know, a dozen or two people, they show up, they, uh, they get in the rafts, they're there for three, five, ten days, they're sleeping in tents uh, and uh, helping out somewhat with the chores. But people pay significant money for that, depending on which river you're hitting. It can, those those expenses, expenditures can be quite high. And the 
the type of com camaraderie and, and bonding that happens when you're in a small group like that is really part of what the value of the experience is. So I don't think you need to have multi-hundred person hotels to start with. I think you can deal with mixed use facilities that have uh, um, multiple functions, sharing common infrastructure. Uh, this was uh, part of the Space Business Park study that was done for NASA a couple of years ago. And uh, the idea would be to use uh, hard shell ha um, habitation lab type modules, but have a dedicated on orbit sound stage that would be available for a variety of purposes. Um, and, uh, but you have it based on current technology. Um, th this is this is marginal in, in part because you have uh, you just don't have that big a volume and when you're trying to plan shots and what it is that you do with um, uh, you know why would somebody spend millions of dollars to come up and do a shoot you can see that you'd have a few that could do it but uh, you want to have ongoing business you don't want flash in the pan type work you want long-term steady state work and uh, over time what you can do in this size facility becomes less and less so the idea of going to the larger volume facilities, the, uh, the, the inflatables or the recycled external tanks, uh, I, I think is really where uh, this industry should go. Uh, so when you look at something like this, you've got 28 foot by 80 foot, you put uh, acrylics uh, at either end so that your, your spectator seating is looking uh, from the end zone, so to speak, and um, uh, in, in something like this, uh, the only way you can get uh, motive force is, uh, is off the wall, so you need uh, some Velcro uh, around the end, uh, and the, the lighting and the air circulation would come from these uh, uh, longitudinal chases here, and um, you would be able to develop um, both space versions of existing sports and entirely new sports. Um, you know, soccer technically is a non-contact sport, uh, you could see uh, an awful lot of interesting visuals happening if you went to something like rugby or lacrosse where you're uh, giving somebody a full body check and watching the uh, Newtonian effects as they go bouncing up and down the walls uh, on their way uh, uh, to a steady state. But this could be highly interesting, could generate a lot of additional revenue for a basic function that would be required just for the people that are coming up there to uh, do their two-week stay. You're not going to want to be cooped up in a in a small stateroom uh, looking out a little porthole for your entire two weeks. Filling out that tourist itinerary is actually pretty tough. Uh, I have uh, spent some time trying to do that, and unless you have things like this, or you are doing uh, a very highly structured science type, uh, and more of the uh, amateur archaeologist type thing where uh, you, you buy a cruise where you're going out uh, uh, spending your day on a SIF tray in an archaeological site or uh, cataloging uh, botanical species on an Amazon cruise. There are uh, a number of things like that where you are effectively working your butt off and paying money for uh, the privilege of doing so. But um, uh, if you can have some pretty nice recreational opportunities, you tend to broaden your base. So, what is the vision of the future? Uh, I've got several in here. This is actually uh, um, the uh, Space Adventures party line, where you look at uh, the next five years, you've got uh, companies like Pioneer and our competitors uh, developing uh, uh, successful flights. You've got the government uh, getting the regulatory issues taken care of. I was very encouraged yesterday uh, as part of the beat up on the Chinese spying bill that uh, you had uh, both Senator Trent Lott and uh, Mr. Cox uh, talking about helping the US RLB industry in order to provide domestic competition to the long march. It's like, yeah, we really want to see that. Um, but uh, the regulatory issues are very much non trivial. And having passenger licensing of space vehicles, even suborbital space vehicles, is um, it's going to be tough. Um, and hopefully, in the next three to five years, it will be worked out. Um, <laughs> If it's much sooner than that, I, I have my doubts. Uh, before Advent Launch Services uh, closed down, they were asserting that they were going to be flying in a couple of years, and uh, I, I had real serious doubts that the FAA would actually let them do it. And if they got to the point where they were ready to start loading people onto that thing floating out of Galveston Bay, I think they were probably going to have federal marshals show up and shut them down. But it's a, it's a moot point now. But it, we assumed that the X Prize would be one, a uh, series of additional prizes going, 
and the giggle factor largely overcome by some few number of people spending lots of money to, to generate the first of these space experiences. And if you think back to the start of any new industry, it always starts out at the high price point. Um, how many people have one of these? Can show of hands? Well, two thirds of the room. This ratio has been going up. I've been asking this little survey question for a few years now. How many people had one uh, in 1990? How many people had a cell phone in 1985? I was one of the first customers in Michigan to sign up for cellular. It cost me $1,500 for a phone hardwired into my car, not a little belt guy. Um, it was 35 or 40 cents a minute, and only about a third of my commute actually had coverage. But I still bought. And between 1985 and 1999, you can see the industry has changed dramatically. It's now a multi-billion dollar industry. They give the phones away in cereal boxes, and it's 10 cents a minute. The exactly the same process would occur with space travel. With any paying customer, you're going to be starting by skimming the cream. You're going to get the $100,000 suborbital X Prize rides where anywhere from a few people to a couple dozen people would climb in a vehicle and, and do an Alan Shepard experience. Uh, initially, space tourism in the space station era will be multiple millions of dollars. Whether that is one million, five million, or 10 million, we simply don't know. And the only way we will know is to put a credible product offering out there and test the market. You know, these things are so stratified that market surveys are essentially meaningless. You can derive ROM estimates by looking at the number of people with the necessary incomes, but the only real way to tell is to go out there with a product offering, and the only way that you're going to get any sort of a sense of what the magnitude of the space tourism market is, is to have some sort of a way to put a product out there, and that's going to mean private citizens going on the shuttle and to station. Huge political issue right now. And with the commercialization policy that's out there, I don't know. The guy, the previous head of USA, was talking about having private citizens on the, on the shuttle. He no longer has that job. Um, the new guy that runs USA has been uh, a little more circumspect about it, but uh, uh, George Abbey has decided opinions about who deserves the right to go into space. And crass commercial, sell a ticket, some amateur with three months of training coming and getting on my shuttle, no way, no how, never, not until my body hits the sidewalk. And, you know, that's what has to happen, that's what has to happen. You know, you get a thud off the ninth floor of building one, and, you know, we'll know we've got about, you know, we have a little more market opportunity. But uh, for the near term, which I define as anything less than 10 years, uh, and, and I'm in the ROP business, so I, I would very much like to be in this world, but for the next 10 years, for human rated orbital space experiences, we're talking about the shuttle. And one of the things that people in the National Space Society could do would be to start talking about putting laws in place and, and having a congressional mandate to start opening some of this stuff up. We already know what is the minimum um, uh, amount of training that's needed for some you know, more or less amateur to fly on the shuttle, and that's the John Glenn mission. If you took out the stuff in the, you know, Glenn was training for about six months, which included both the basics and whatever it was he was doing on his research. If you took the John Glenn training regime, stripped out all the stuff he was doing for space research or sleep research and whatever else that, uh, that he was at there, you probably would have a part-time three-month program to safety qualify somebody to sit in a jump seat on a shuttle. And that would be... I think entirely acceptable to have to have the ability to, on occasion, when a shuttle mission is not mass limited, to be able to have a private citizen take that jump seat and pay dearly for the privilege of doing it. There's nothing wrong with it, and that's the commercial world, and that's what we need to uh, have happen. 
This is another vision of the future. This is the, uh, the New Space Industries workshop from last year. This was a kind of a consensus document. There were about 50 of us. It was an invitation-only deal that uh, uh, NASA put on, uh, and they had um, uh, the um, usual suspects and then some of the outsiders like me uh, uh, in there. Uh, and, and we spent two days working over a, a scenario of how you get from here to there. I would urge you, if you uh, have any interest at all in this, to get a copy of the New Space Industries Workshop Report. It is a marvelous document. It talks about almost everything that's in this program. Uh, it's at Marshall Space Flight Center, is, uh, is the, the originator. I don't know if it's on the web yet, uh, but it is a wonderful document. It talks about satellite servicing, uh, orbital transfer services, um, resources, energy, tourism, space business. I mean, the, the whole gamut of the next 20, 25 years of commercial space activity is worked through plausibly in a 50, 60 page document. And for those of us that are interested in this sort of a future of space, it's, it's definitely something to have in your library. But the, the point here is that you can see reasonable milestones from where we're at right now uh, and things happening now, the legislative front enabling this sort of thing to happen. Uh, it does not require technology, it requires Congress telling them what to do and uh, presumably maybe even getting the president to support something. You know, hey, what a thought. Uh, but you know, this stuff in here we can do right now. And the commercialization, uh, as in other things, ramps up very slowly where you can see in the next 10 years having fully functional facilities in space um, and uh, the reusable launch vehicles coming online and um, uh, facilities for uh, lunar and planetary exploration having a significant commercial component. That the, the dialogue is not increase NASA budget, put an extra billion dollars in here, this and this and this. You're fighting a zero-sum game when you talk about doing anything in here with the government being the only source of funding. You've got to broaden the base, and, and this is uh, the consensus of our group from last year about how you might happen to do it. This is, uh, this is the Boeing vision of the world. This is part of a, of a contract that I did with them last year where you look at the, the sort of the now kind of time frame and uh, uh, you start to see uh, you know, a few little things popping up that uh, appear to be commercial like uh, Mattel licensing that little guy. Uh, in, uh, in the next five years, um, the idea that you could have um, the, the Lunacorp type thing where you can start to get virtual experiences through private sector investment, um, uh, upgrades of the space shuttle potentially, uh, other vehicles coming online, uh, crew return vehicle online, and some other space transportation assets starting to uh, be in place um, you know, within uh, the, the time between now and ISS assembly complete. And in the post ISS assembly complete, um, starting to see a few more things happen. Privately developed space tugs and more um, orbital infrastructure being developed. Uh, the ability to have effectively a construction stack for putting together large vehicles for uh, lunar and interplanetary missions and the start of uh, uh, the Space Business Park commercial space station uh, motif. Now this, you know, this, the, the vision of the future, this is what got me into this when I was in college in the late 70s. This vision of the future was eloquently painted by Gerard O'Neill who had essentially no clue about how business works. It's unfortunate, he, he was a visionary, he came up with interesting designs and had just not any concept whatsoever about what it's gonna to take to do it. When I first looked at the work of O'Neill, um, <clears throat> uh, I was in architecture school at the time and the idea of uh, doing this sort of thing, I immediately saw effectively what he was talking about was development of commercial real estate in orbit. He didn't say it that way. I don't think he even knew that that was the right question, much less that that was the, the answer in the business model. But when you look at, at the, at the O'Neill vision, you see uh, you know, California suburbia is really what, uh, what they were trying to paint out. Um, and the only way you do that 
is with a, a diverse consumer-oriented economy. Um, this is uh, th this is kind of a, of a how do you actually do that? Uh, this was done a couple of years ago for an AIAA paper. Uh, David Smitherman is a wonderful guy. If you ever get a chance to meet him at a conference, he's an architect that works at Marshall on advanced concepts. But a lot of thought has been put into how you might actually do O'Neill class structures. Um, considerably less thought has taken place about how you pay for it. And the, the transactions that make up the support, the financial support for, for an asset like this are every bit as important. This happens to be uh, a rigidized inflatable uh, um, that would be uh, uh, deployed and uh, you know, stuff sprayed around the inside and the additional infrastructure built out around it. So there's plenty of, of technology, plenty of design studies, and considerably less about how you, how you pay for it. Why would somebody spend many billions of dollars to build a park in space? I really don't know. I mean, I, I love the vision, and I question the, uh, the, the business case a lot. Um, but uh, the vision is what, uh, what we're all here for. And without, um, uh, without some ideas about uh, where this goes, I, you, some of you may not have actually seen this. This, was, this actually preceded O'Neill. Uh, an architect named Paolo Soleri uh, was, in the 70s was developing a, a, a development concept called Arcologies. And uh, mostly they were um, Newtown developments on Earth, but he did uh, a spin grab space habitat um, with uh, a little different uh, approach. Now, all of the living is in these little rabbit warren towers, which are a, a hallmark of the Solari arcology design. Uh, but uh, this, this work actually uh, preceded O'Neill by about five years. So, I mean, why are we doing this? Here's all of human history in one chart. Um, we are a technological civilization. We are a species that has exploded on the planet in the last 100 years. When you look at the previous 10,000 years since the beginnings of, of technology and the agricultural revolution um, to now, we have this uh, slow climb that all of a sudden starts to spike about 100 years ago. When you see curves like this, um, they, uh, they do one of two things. Uh, largely, this sort of a spike is followed by an equally precipitous drop. And this stuff is happening in our lifetime. And certainly within our lifetimes and the lifetimes of our children, where this curve goes is going to have a huge impact on our quality of life. And if you're starting to look at Malthusian checks and balances beginning to occur in the next 20 to 50 years, and this world just goes to hell in a handbasket. That is the probable course of events unless we broaden the base, unless we expand the consumer economy and the world industrial base beyond Leo and into the near Earth solar system. This has to happen one step at a time or Effectively, we lose the opportunity because if we're not doing it in the next 20 years, the resources simply will not be there. Now, this generation is the generation that will either make this happen or, or not. And I'm trying to do everything I can to make it happen. And a lot of the people that are in this room are thinking about it the same way. So, my closing here. With enough money, anything is possible. Um, here you look at the, uh, the, the old pie chart again, and two-thirds of everything that happens for seven trillion dollars a year of activity in the U.S. and about twenty trillion dollars a year in the world economy, two-thirds of that is going to consumer expenditures. This thing here is actually a, a cell tower in my hometown of Ann Arbor. Um, it's uh, built on the campus of Domino's Farms, a consumer company that makes their money no, 9.95 at a time, and uh, this particular site was 
a very high value site to the cellular companies. This part of town had horrible cellular coverage, drop calls all the time. They could not find a place to put that cell tower other than on the campus of Domino's Farms. And they kept coming back to him, coming back to him, please, all, all we need is this little piece of dirt. You know, what, what, you've got hundreds of acres, what's it going to cost? And, and it turns out that Tom Monaghan is a fan of architecture, a big fan of Frank Lloyd Wright, and he had spent a lot of money building his campus with a certain architectural style in mind. And when the, uh, uh, when the cellular company kept coming back to him the fifth or sixth time, he said, all right, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a site under two conditions. One, my architect designs it. Two, whatever it costs, you pay for it. And they did. Cellular companies make enough money that a 180 foot tall urban sculpture, it's at, it, at night it's got these little uh, changeable neon tubes that sort of run up and down in different colors. It's, uh, it's a pretty interesting little thing. But this thing cost them 10 times what a normal cell tower would cost. And it's paid for, you know, now 10 cents a minute on your, on your, on your little handheld phone is paying for one guy's whim. You know, there is nothing at all that says that this has to be this way other than an arm's length negotiation between two private sector entities with cash flow from consumer industries creating something that uh, I haven't seen anywhere else in the world. Uh, whether you like it or not, it's a different story, but it certainly is uh, an interesting example of how us uh, crass commercialization guys actually work and what sometimes we have to deal with in order to uh, make our visions a reality. Um, no. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to close. Uh, some of you may have heard this before, but I think it is uh, uh, highly relevant. This is a quote from Arthur C. Clarke, the book, The Challenge of the Spaceship, written in 1959, 40 years ago, people. The future development of mankind on a spiritual, no less than material plane, is bound up with the conquest of space. The future of which I have spoken is now being shaped by men working in quiet offices and by men taking instrument readings amid the savage roar of harness jets. Some are engineers, some are dreamers, but many are both. The time will come when they can say with T.E. Lawrence, all men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds wake in the day to find that it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men for they may act out their dreams with open eyes to make it possible. Thus it has always been in the past, for our civilization is no more than the sum of all the dreams that earlier ages have brought to fulfillment. And so it must always be. For if men cease to dream, if they turn their backs on the universe, then the story of our race will end. Thank you. The question is, is the regulatory environment in other countries more or less conducive than, uh, than in the U.S.? Um, according to Kistler, it is. Uh, they found a much more uh, acceptable regulatory regime in Australia than in the U.S. Um, in a lot of ways, the, you have to be able to do business in the U.S. to be able to uh, generate the kind of money. The rest of the world looks to the U.S. business models, looks to the U.S. forms of contract, looks to insurance, regulatory, licensing. The, the U.S. is the lead in all this, and uh, trying to deal with uh, offshore banks and, uh, you know, a company in the Grand Caymans and things like that, yeah, you can do it, but it's a whole lot easier to access the capital markets if you are uh, U.S. standard compliant, and so I've always based everything on being able to do business in the U.S., and I dearly hope that I'm not uh, <laughs> wrong on that one. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, it seems to me that the, the problem we're facing, one of the big problems we're facing today is not so much that not only do people not want to take risks for themselves anymore, 
but they are unwilling to allow other people to take risks on their own nickel. And I don't quite know how we get around that, how we get around the fact that the FAA has such a high threshold now to certify anything that it's basically driven all of the small airplane manufacturers out of new designs, for instance. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is a, a uniquely U.S. problem. I suspect it's not. <coughs> well, uh, the question is, uh, I, I'm repeating these for the, for the tape. I, I was told by the moderator that I had to do that. So the, the, the question is that um, uh, the regulatory regime uh, limits risk taking. Um, it's true. Um, you can point to um, certain things that are, uh, are risky and are allowed. Uh, even within the FAA, if you are flying an experimental plane, the regulations largely don't care if you kill yourself in the process of it. Uh, you have a minimal set of safety inspections and they, um, uh, they tie you to a state for the first 25 hours of flying that you're uh, not supposed to you know, be so many miles from your home base uh, in, in order to uh, shake out uh, what, uh, what you might do. But there are lots of things that uh, there are substantive risks. Um, and a lot of them involve getting a license. If you're going to climb a, a mountain, if you're going to uh, uh, scuba dive, if you're going to uh, uh, cave dive, I mean, there's lots of things where there is a, you know, 10% or better chance that you may not make it out alive, and yet it happens. Uh, the perception within the space launch side is this four nines of reliability, uh, three times 10 to the minus six probability of killing anybody on the ground, da 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 da, -da. Um, But there are other elements of the economy that you can point to where maybe there is a 10% chance that you will be uh, killed or seriously injured, and yet if you sign the right waiver you know, uh, and or uh, obtain the right insurance, it still happens. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, hoping that the regulatory regime tends more towards things like the experimental aircraft regs as opposed to the Part 23 uh, uh, certified passenger vehicle regs, and you know, that's part of my job is to you know influence this regulatory rulemaking so that it's more like that and, and, and uh, more favorable for, for business. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to add to, for, for him, is if you look at Roton, it's got an end number on the tail. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, there, yeah, uh, Roton is, uh, is flying under experimental aircraft rigs. Um, and they will, uh, as will we uh, with Pioneer, uh, up until the point where you light up the rocket engine. At that point, you need to have a different license from AST uh, for the rocket-powered flight. Um, so uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's a situation that the regulatory regime is somewhat fluid, uh, but uh, the people that are making the, the regs, I think, are serious about it, and I think their heart's in the right place, and I, I'm very encouraged by what I'm hearing um, out of AST. And, uh, when you talk about things like uh, in the destination side, where does uh, where does the building code get generated for an orbital infrastructure? You know, what a space hotel or space business park is going to require some sort of a code book. None of that stuff exists, and uh, so what we've been trying to do is build up uh, an early consensus for what that regulatory regime will be like, and talk to people like uh, Keith Kaplan Singer in the Department of Commerce, who I think would be you know, perfectly capable of taking the lead on developing regulatory regimes for destination systems as well as transportation systems. So uh, we, we need to just stay on top of it and push. It might, might be five or 10 years down the road, but uh, it's not too early to start talking. The report that you had mentioned, that, uh, do you know, can you tell us the name of it again? The, uh, the report is the New Space Industries Workshop uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a Marshall Space Flight Center publication, and um, best bet is to call David Smith. Uh, I, uh, he's, a, he's a Marshall guy, and I believe he actually has the copies in his possession. Uh, if not, he, uh, 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 he may ha have it up on his website. I, I believe he was talking about putting up it. In fact, Dave Smitherman's website has a lot of really good stuff on it. So, uh, um, I would encourage you all to, uh, to, you know, to look and see what he has there. What's his website? 
<laughs> oh, it's David Smitherman at something at Marshall. If you go to Marshall, the Marshall website, you should be able to track it down. Bob? Do you know he's running a geocar symposium? No. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, <coughs> he's uh, I think it's going to be in uh, June. And, uh, Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I did see something about that. Yeah, uh, the geo tower, the uh, yeah. uh, space elevator. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah I mean, they, there, are, there are a handful of people within NASA that really are pushing this. Of the 19,000 people, uh, <laughs> the people that are really out in this advanced world, you can you know, certainly count on two hands and maybe on one hand. But there, are, uh, there, there is a core there that is, uh, I think, really trying to push the agency in the right direction and reach out to... Uh, those of us in the private sector that are like-minded. Yeah. So, um, just a kind of comment on something you said earlier with regards to the training issue for people flying on the shuttle or other vehicles. Uh, don't you think that directly ties into reliability? Right now, uh, shuttle is considered to be 99% reliable. Mm -hmm. uh, the airlines, I guess, with their six nines or whatever, consider 30 seconds of training enough. Um, somewhere in between, when you get it down to a, to a week. Yeah, I think uh, the, the question is, uh, is relative training time in relation to the relative risk of the system. And you can actually see a, a couple of graphs crossing at some point as the reliability goes up and uh, amount of training time going down. But um, uh, I, I would be surprised if uh, uh, in, in this parallel universe in which private citizens actually could ride on the shuttle, that the, uh, the training regime would not be measured in months rather than weeks. Uh, um, for uh, uh, I'm giving a Pioneer talk Sunday morning, and I, I will be talking more about uh, um, some of the passenger aspects in a vehicle like ours, um, where which would be a suborbital vehicle. I would think you could do the, the training in, in less than a day. Uh, we were probably packaging it or package it around like a three to five day, maybe seven day. Uh, uh, all expense excursion and, and with the end of the thing being the actual ride. Um, but uh, it, even when you're in, in space for 10 minutes, uh, there are still a lot more in the way of safety issues because if you have uh, a decompression when you're in space, the little yellow plastic cup dropping down from the ceiling, you're going to cut it. Uh, <laughs> you won't drop <laughs> <the> zero <back. laughs> Yeah, well, that's true too. But uh, uh, that, that's. That's actually the biggest um, uh, biggest issue on all that is that if you have a decompression, um, you know what what do you do, and does it require that you wear a full pressure suit? Or uh, some of the early shuttle missions, they weren't in pressure suits; they had some sort of a, of a helmet and a neck collar, and there was some idea that if you uh, if you kept your lungs and, and your head pressurized, that the rest of your body could uh, could take decompression, but. I, I simply don't know. I think it's an area of research that uh, there's probably a lot of military research in this regard, but I, uh, I would very much like to see this roll into uh, uh, something that would take some serious study and develop some real requirements. But uh, I think, yep, I'm up. Um, okay, thank you.